よろしくお願いします。Hello, everyone. Welcome to Startup, Startup City Sapporo webinars. Today's webinar focuses on the clean tech.、Uh, Hokkaido is the leading clean tech region where ecotourism eco and zero emissions are becoming more and more popular, while ESG investment is、uh, becoming mainstream in Europe. The Japanese startup ecosystem is st still slow to take off from the concept of ESG investment. Through these webinars, we aim to learn about the clean tech investment trends, clean tech solutions offered from,、uh, from startups, startup support initiatives to accelerate the growth of clean tech clusters. Minasan, konbanwa. Kyo no tema wa clean tech des. 北海道はエコツーリズムやゼ,リゼロエミッションが盛んなクリーンテック先進エリアです。欧州では ESG 投資が主流になりつつありますが、日本のスタートアップエコシステムでは ESG 投資の概念から離陸するのがまだ遅れています。このウェビナーを通じて以下の内容を学ぶことがをできます。クリーンテック投資のトレンド、スタートアップが提供するクリーンテック関連ソリューション、クリーンテッククラスターの成長を加速するためのスタートアップ支援の取り組みです。そして今日は札幌に新しくできたスタートアップハブ、池内ラボに来ています。今年10月にオープンしたインキュベーション施設で、北欧、フィンランドをテーマとした内装です。フィンランドを中心とした様々なコラボレーションプロジェクトに取り組んでいます。ぜひ札幌に来た際はお越しください。Today's we are from 池内ラボ、the new Startup Hub in Sapporo. This incubation facility opened October this year. The interior design is based on the theme of Scandinavian and Finland. IKUC Lab are working on the various collaborative projects centered in, on Finland. Please visit here when you come to Sapporo. So, today's event hosted by Startup City Sapporo. This project, led by City of Sapporo City, discovered to nature startups. Startup City Sapporo project has been developing various public private partnership projects since、uh, 2019 with the mission of supporting the, with the philosophy of startup first. Our various members support you. With diverse backgrounds, so please feel free to contact us if you have any questions and startups. 本日のイベントは、札幌市が主導するスタートアップの発掘育成プロジェクト、スタートアップシティ札幌主催でお送りします。スタートアップシティ札幌では、札幌北海道から世界を変えるスタートアップの事業成長を支援する。をミッションに2019年より官民連携のさまざまなプロジェクトを展開していますスタートアップファーストが理念に多彩な経歴を持つ事務局メンバーがサポートしますのでスタートアップに関することがございましたらぜひお問い合わせをお願いしますそれでは早速ですがキーノートセッションに移りますハローエルキーハローハローハロー Please start your keynote. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation.、Um, I'll start also sharing my screen so that you'll see my brief presentation as well.、Uh, 
Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting to this event. Um, I'm excited to be here. And today, uh, obviously, as I'm wearing many hats, I will be representing Clinic Estonia, but as well as Beamline Accelerator, as the CEO of Beamline Accelerator couldn't attend uh, this time. But just to kick off uh, from a kind of a wider perspective, so my presentation is divided into a few a uh, few sectors. Uh, so I'm starting off with a rather a bird's eye view on the, on the startup sector itself, then diving more into global clean tech, then European clean tech, and then the Estonian clean tech sector, and finishing up with the Beamlines uh, view on the on the clean tech sector and the acceleration um, of clean tech startups, very early stage startups. So in general, um, Estonia is is a rather a leading organization, or sorry, a leading country when it comes to startups investments um, per capita. Of course, Estonia is a small small country uh, with nearly 1.3 1.2 million uh, inhabitants, but we do have a, a very large amount of startups in our country. Uh, we even have this joke that everybody in Estonia basically has a startup. Um, we are a breeding ground of unicorns with more than 10 unicorns so far in Estonia, which makes us in the statistics the, the most unicorns per capita globally. If you look at the investment amounts uh, that's been pouring into the startup sector, so this is for the startups uh, sector in general, then you can see a rapid growth within the past few years. Now, if we're looking at the clean tech sector, for example, in Europe, um, we can see a huge trend of significant increase between 2020 and 2021. Later on, I'm going to also show you the trend that's going on in Estonia, which is very similar to that. In Europe, we are seeing larger uh, deals, meaning the, the, the deal count has been going down, but uh, the amount of investment per deal has been going up, which is very... Uh, welcome and which is very needed to scale up the already existing clean tech innovations or clean tech startups that help to increase the efficiency, for example, in industries, but also to provide alternative resources, alternative raw materials, alternative energy sources to the current um, more polluting ones that are rather fossil fuel based. And these are the clean tech startups. Well, that's more or less kind of like the clean tech definition. Looking globally, the trend has been similar, uh, but not as huge as in Europe. Well, Europe is known for its very tight regulations that is kind of driving the force between adopting novel innovations, which makes it more easier for the clean tech startups to gain new customers or pilot partners, for example, in within larger companies or, or larger industries. Now, looking at Cleantech Estonia, what we are doing as we are talking about the ecosystem, the Cleantech ecosystem, uh, then ecosystem is kind of like a soft, soft skills or soft skill development, but it has a huge impact. So since 2015 or 2016, we have been incubating, accelerating hundreds and hundreds of very, very early stage startups, but also teams that are not yet startups. So we help them define or understand if there is a potential with their product or the service that they're trying to bring to the market. And to do that, we are have been the partners of uh, the Europe's largest innovation and technology institute called European Institute of Innovation and Technology and the climate uh, knowledge and innovation community bringing in non-dilutive uh, financing or non-equity financing. So far, we have accelerated more than 50 early stage startups. And as you can see, the, the amounts raised by alumni amounts today up to 91 million euros. We are also managing a thing called Clean's Founders Club, which is essential for the founders that are visionary and are pursuing in the same direction of the, the new economies for them to meet, greet, um, create collaboration projects or any way other collaborate or, or exchange their, their experiences and knowledges, for example. Beamline Accelerator, I'm going to talk a bit, uh, bit later on. Then a little green fund, um, which just shows that there are 
more up and coming funds dedicated to clean tech sector or green tech sector, take it as you as you'd like. There's also green tech, clean tech, and climate tech. These are kind of terms that are used uh, very mixed um, in different contexts, but can be regarded as something that enables more sustainable, innovative solutions to come to the market, as well as the clean tech for Baltics, uh, which is a bit hidden in my screen. Uh, I will talk briefly about that a bit later on as well. And as you can see, the survival rate of clean tech startups is more than 80%, meaning that mostly clean tech startups are hardware related. That means that they do tackle the very core of the economies, meaning bringing on more products than services to the market to well battle the incumbent technologies that we have today prevalent. In Estonia, the clean tech investments, we have around 90 clean tech startups that have raised investments. Of course, there's more startups, more than 100 that are there in the market that have, for example, um, raised investments or got some um, grants or awards from different incubation or acceleration programs. But those that have raised investments, there's more than 90. As you can see, the curved line, the orange curved line, depicts the investments into the clean tech sector. Now, comparing to comparing 2020 and 2021, well, you can see an evident growth in it. It's nearly three times the growth, also following quite nicely the overall U European, but also global trend in the clean tech investments. This year, we're anticipating the figures to go up to 180 or 190 million euros. If you look at the sectors, well, we are in an energy crisis and we do care about the energy independence that we must um, contain and what we must still uh, have. Uh, thereby, the majority of the investments do go into energy technologies. So energy and power uh, is, the, is the blue, the dark blue um, in those graphs. And the, the second sector that is prevalent is the light blue, which is the transportation and logistics. So moving people and stuff from A to B. A huge trend that we see is in the materials and chemicals, although that is not yet depicted um, too heavily on, the, on those graphs. But there's numerous startups that are developing some kind of alternative materials or, or chemicals that can be used in the industries either, for example, in the packaging or in the CO2 um, um, capture and utilization, for example. Um, just a few things that are up and coming in this sector in our local setting, so in Estonia. Um, the government of Estonia just quite recently launched the Green Fund of 100 million euros, which is dedicated to clean tech startups in early stages. And they're launching an, a series of fund of fund calls. So uh, we are um, expecting circa 60 million euros into clean tech sector startups in Estonia to be invested, as well as the direct investments of 20 million, so amounting to 80 million euros. And out of this 100 million fund, um, consecutive funds will be issued when the time is ripe. So most. Mm, probably in the coming years. As well as from the Estonian Investment Center, the Green Technologies 5 development clusters will be developed, which is a huge opportunity for local, but also international startups that would like to develop, for example, the bioresources. There will be different calls in different sectors. So today we have the bioresources open for the fund, uh, for the tender, uh, and it will be a 1 million euro accelerator program slash um, cluster or the ecosystem development program. What is more up and coming is the international kind of acceptance and, and the, the viewpoint, um, for example, Breakthrough Energy, which is supporting the development of clean tech for Baltics. And the clean tech for Baltics is essentially a policy advocacy tool creating different coalitions. So coalition of investors that we launched a few weeks ago in Riga in Latvia with 11 VCs across the Baltics. 
we are at anticipating also with the coalition of ecosystem developers. So there we, we have different innovation agencies, uh, chambers of commerce, um, local startup ecosystem players such as Startup Estonia, Startup Lithuania, Latvia, for example, as well as scale ups. So the coalition of scale ups of startups. So Cleantech for Baltics is taking a very holistic approach to this. Uh, to the whole clean tech sector of development and trying to translate what is coming from the European Commission, for example, in, in terms of regulations or legislations, and translate this into the local setting opportunities for either VCs or investors, ecosystem developers, the politicians, as well as the government and, and the startups themselves. And this has been it. Well, Clintech Estonia has been developing since 2016. Um, it has many so-called spin-offs or, or novel opportunities that we saw that are needed in the market. The first of that is Beamline Accelerator that I'm going to talk now a bit later as well. We have the Clintech for Baltics that I described as well as the Little Green Fund. So Clintech Estonia is taking an overarching approach towards developing the ecosystem. Um, and this is the main kind of setting how we do that. <clears throat> now, as, as I mentioned, um, we're in different hands. Uh, I'm also the co-founder of Beamline Accelerator. As, uh, as the CEO of Beamline Accelerator couldn't attend today, so I'm taking the stage on behalf of her. On behalf of uh, Trin Lucas, you will find her contacts in the end of this presentation as well. We all know the, the situation in the climate change, uh, how that affects economies, as well as how economies and their current status, their current operations, how they affect the climate change. It is very much interlinked, and thereby we see that bringing in innovations from early stages, from very different walks of life, has to pay um, a toll and has to affect the economy that we play today. So if we're looking at the kind of the overarching investments globally, according to Net Zero Insights and the state of climate tech, in Europe and US, um, you can see the trend is, well, the trend is there. The, the trend is evident that the investments are rising uh, in the sector, as well as the, the amount of num uh, startups and the deal count is rising throughout throughout the years with a huge jump between 2020 and 2021. In Estonia, as was mentioned a bit before as well, so this, for example, is according to the Beamline Accelerator and our alumni, so Beamline Accelerator alumni. If you look at those investments, you can see in 2020, I guess the amount of investments into our alumni was around 8 million euros, while in 2021, we saw the amount to being 36, 37 million euros. Meaning that, yes, the, lo the local startups, uh, although Beamline has international scope for startups, they gather their seed and pre-seed investments from the local setting and from the local investors. But if they're scaling up, they're going into international markets or rather seeking for investors from Scandinavia, Germany, France, um, as well as the US, for example. And this is where the larger deals today still come from predominantly. What we define as clean tech is five categories, which is agriculture and food. Everything related to that can be also ICT solutions or, or hardware solutions, energy and power, same thing. The most popular these days is the demand response. So helping the grid to, to balance the, um, the renewable energies uh, kind of, um, ideal of that this uh, the wind is not blowing at all times and the sun isn't shining at all times but the grid needs to be balanced and for that there's different ways how to um, bundle up capacities that could be um, well, balancing the grid as i mentioned before as well the materials and chemicals that we see as for example substitutes for for um, single-use plastics or packaging material etc we see resources in the environment, which is more kind of like ICT solutions. So enabling technologies, for example, in the textile industry, manufacturing, etc. 
We have transportation and logistics, well, getting people from A to B with the most sustainable opportunities. The team behind Beamline Accelerator, the, the lady from the, the third from the left is Trino Lucas, who is the CEO of Beamline Accelerator. So managing the crowd of seven people at the moment. Most of the people are co-founders. Um, and we have managed as a team to have a portfolio with a survival rate of nearly 80%. All those people are very, very closely knit to the clean tech sector. So they know what they're doing. They have multiple years of, or even decades of experience in working ha hands-on with the clean tech startups and their founders from their well, day zeros. What is Beamline Accelerator? Um, it's a three month accelerator program dedicated for 10 teams. So 10 teams, two times per year. So 20 teams per year. Before the accelerator program starts, we do a filter. So we filter out 20 to 25 or 30 teams that we pre-accelerate. So we try to get to know them as we are running a hybrid program, meaning that part of the program is on site in Estonia and the majority of the program is, is online. But we still need to, get, need to get to know the teams and the teams need to get to know us if there's a match. For that, we have organized a pre-accelerator program where we do that. And then later on, if they graduate, we have an alumni program for them as well to be engaged still after years after the engagement. We offer 60,000 euros of investment as a convertible loan to the startups, but also the network that we bring on is very closely knit to the global clean tech ecosystem and more closely in Europe. The portfolio to date that we have on the right hand side, you can see the batch three that is currently ongoing. Well, we have 10 teams and the rest of the teams here are the startups that have grown from us, that have that we have invested in or supported and that, are, that are making the change in the future economies that we have today. And a shout out from Trino. We are looking at LPs as well, or limited partners. We are uh, scaling up the Beam One Accelerator activities as a fund in the coming years. And if you have any questions or any comments, or you're a startup or you're an investor, please do reach out to Trino at Trino at Beam One. That's fund. And my name is Ed Kenny, and uh, I'd like to thank you for this kind of opportunity. And I'll be seeing you later on at the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Erki. So next, uh, from Lean Startup Croatia, Philip. Hello, Philip. Hi, how are you? Yeah, how are you? First, good. congratulations and good luck, semi final. Welcome. Thank you very much. So, please start your keynote. Yes, thank you. I, I hope everybody can see the slides and, and can hear me well. Uh, thank you for, for your kind words. Um, although all, you, all of you might know that Croatia now is um, a big force in football, but besides of that, we also uh, do some other things. And in history, there were some nice inventions. And uh, in Croatia, there were inventors who were famous. So you might not know, but the cravat, the, the, the tie that all of us are wearing on special events, is invented in Croatia and wear by Croatian soldiers. Also, Nikola Tesla, the inventor of alternative current, is from Croatia. The pen, the mechanical pen that you're using every day, is also invented in Croatia and so, so many other things. Uh, so Croatia is a small, small country in um, Southeastern Europe, as you can see on this map, with only 3.7 million people, but we try to do different uh, things and also differentiate us with, with inventions that I've mentioned. But not only those that are happening in the past, but some that we might create in the future as well. Um, I'm coming from Linstad of Croatia, uh, one of the founders, and uh, we are an innovation agency. 
I'll briefly tell you what we do, but also explain some of the, the projects that we are running here in Croatia and the region to actually uh, boost and run the, the ecosystem, especially the startup ecosystem, and then focus on, on green tech and clean tech at the end. Uh, we've started our journey in 2013 um, as uh, organizing different meetups and gathering the community. So the community was always on the first place. Um, after that, we've developed some, some methodologies and approaches to uh, help startups in early stage um, actually based on lean startup and customer development methodologies that we've uh, ran all over the Europe, but also in different parts of the world. And today uh, we have um, pretty vast experience in, in creating innovation um, events, innovation programs and ecosystem building projects. Um, why we are different is because we have also a scientific but entrepreneurial experience, uh, a nice and very reliable uh, network of, of uh, partners, and our tailor-made approach to different projects is uh, something that people know us for. Um, experience that we have and the know-how we, we've built in, in Europe, but also in Southeast Asia and, and Americas, uh, where we saw different uh, opportunities, but also same challenges for startups in early stage that could be solved by applying uh, some of the principles uh, which are the backbone of lean startup and customer development. Um, nowadays, what we do uh, are three things, uh, more or less three pillars. So we do innovation events like hackathons, innovation challenges, and, and uh, open community events like this one. We do innovation programs, which means that we run uh, pre-incubation, incubation, and pre acceleration programs that I will tell you more about uh, in, in a few moments. And we do ecosystem development consulting, which means that we help different municipalities, universities, corporates to actually build their ecosystem locally and regionally. Um, some of the projects that I might uh, highlight here are from different areas, and uh, it was very nice, uh, very nice listening to Elko about the uh, Estonian focus on on clean tech and uh, how nice data could be shown. Uh, the case in Croatia is that uh, here we have a, a lot of agnostic programs, a lot of uh, programs without a specific vertical or topic. But in in last few years, we started uh, organizing and and implementing projects that have a special vertical as as its focus. So some of those will be shown in, in these slides. The the first one is called Empowering Women in Agri Food, which was uh, a project that we ran this year with uh, ten female entrepreneurs doing um, startups in agriculture and um, food processing industry. Um, one of the teams, actually, the, the winning team will be presenting uh, later after after me, not as design and Manuela. So we will be able to to listen uh, what they actually do. Um, this was a six month support program uh, focused only on women, and it was supported by EIT Food, the European Institute for Innovation and Technology. Um, one one uh, similar project was also get started in health innovation, uh, which was focused on the vertical of healthcare and health tech, where we had uh, 13 teams. Uh, we just had a demo day last week, uh, and this is a fresh picture from this demo day. So all of the teams had had gone through the uh, market validation and market access stage. Uh, through the six months of interdisciplinary support. Um, the partner of ours in this project was the University of Zagreb, which has access to different um, resources as laboratories and, and uh, faculty so that they could get uh, additional uh, scientific uh, support as well. Um, another example is a project that uh, we do for a few years now in um, Split, which is the um, south, uh, south part of Croatia, as you can see on the small map uh, in the upper right corner. Um, so it's a nice place, very touristic, uh, maybe uh, something that uh, people from Japan like to visit because it's, it's an ancient, ancient city from Rome. 
but also has has a very nice Mediterranean vibe. But over there, we also have some nice and successful startups, which are mostly focused on tourism. So I would say that this uh, this program has had a heritage in, in touristic uh, applications in the last few years. Um, another thing that we are doing, which is uh, an interesting suggestion for some of you that would like to develop your uh, ecosystems further, is TeamUp uh, as, as a project that we run for the community where we actually help founders to find early employees or co-founders for their teams. Um, we also support different verticals here. So we did TeamUps in Health Tech, uh, Web3, AgriFood, and so on. And the video you are seeing is um, one of our recent events uh, for Web3 in uh, November. So the team up is actually part of it is uh, live events, but other part are online uh, online platform to make uh, make matchmaking of teams with their uh, potential employees and uh, have a, a wider reach in, in the community. Um, and the last project that I will uh, present here, but also then uh, talk more about is uh, Green Tech Entrepreneurship Challenge. Um, that was uh, a project which is um, in, in the topic of today's webinar, um, the Green Tech. Uh, but uh, what is important here is that this was our effort to build the ecosystem bottom up. What does that mean is uh, that we actually had students, high school students of technical vocational schools who are supposed to uh, study a different uh, electronics, um, machining, um, robotics, and, and uh, similar uh, areas to use their skills, use their knowledge to think how they can, can they create uh, green tech solutions based on the challenges that we gave and uh, try to start their entrepreneurial journey from a very early age. Um, so project called Green Tech was um, implemented in Croatia in five technical vocational schools that you can see on the map of, of Northern Croatia. Um, and also with our partners in Macedonia in five schools in Macedonia. Um, and we gave them three challenges. Uh, the first challenge was how to use thermal energy from discharged wastewater to heat buildings or for any other purpose. The, the second one was how to protect forests and increase afforestation using technologies. And the third one, how to increase the use of renewable energy sources uh, for electricity production in Croatia. For the project, we had two very important partners. One of uh, them was called um, <laughs> Zagreb Disposal Waters, which is a company that has a big purifier that you can see here on the picture which uh, helps the whole city of Zagreb to actually purify their water uh, from, from the sewage. And the Infobip, uh, Croatia's first unicorn, a big um, and famous IT company, which also has offices in, in Japan. Um, besides those two big companies, we also invited a few startups that will also pitch later today. Uh, one of them is Project O2 which uh, does deforestation and that inspired us to uh, pick one of the challenges in the area of, of afforestation. Um, and Seacross uh, from uh, Mario, who is going to pitch later on, um, which also protects our sea and waters uh, by using uh, satellite images. So those startups uh, which are already successful had been uh, role models to the teams the student teams and have also judged in the final competition so the whole um, idea behind this was to actually provide the schools with student trainings which was a five week long training with five different uh, topics and then have a school competition and an inter-school competition which then um selected three most successful teams uh for this year uh, i can briefly go through a few images of of this project but you can see that um green tech challenge accepted the first workshop where we had a um, understanding of uh, the climate change and why students should care and work in in the direction of preventing uh, climate change then we had a part with the problem solution fit 
um, also few uh, entrepreneurs who were role models explaining how they actually use the technology and how their business models work. So the students were defining their business models as well, doing some solution prototyping and testing of, of their uh, solutions. Um, and these are some of the prototypes they've created and then learning how to pitch their idea how to present in front of the audience this was the opportunity for them to actually participate in the school competition so locally the best teams from the schools were then invited to pitch on the inter-school competition the one which was um, organized in uh, in november late november a few weeks ago so yes, the video you already uh, saw a brief uh, trailer from from the interschool competition. Um, what we wanted to achieve with this project is actually to involve schools, vocational schools, into the uh, fight against climate change, but also by applying innovation and skills of the students. What I must uh, highlight is that all of the jury members who were participating uh, were fascinated how advanced the uh, solutions that those uh, young students were creating and also how well they were presented to the jury. So among 12, uh, 12 presented startups, uh, three winners from, from the schools were selected and rewarded with uh, the financial prize to actually support them in developing this, these ideas further on. Um, this is briefly what I wanted to show you today, because after uh, my, my presentation, there will be uh, three more advanced startups that already operate in, in green tech and clean tech area uh, pitching. But one of the things that we want to do in Croatia is to uh, start bottom up and besides gathering the community, also um, invite young people, students uh, from the schools and from universities to uh, take part in, in startups and uh, fight climate change using their skills and, and knowledge. Um, if you want to reach out, if there is something that we can help out with, uh, maybe you would like to try to do a similar project in, in your own country, we are very, very happy to, to support and uh, give you our know-how and lessons learned that we got from, from this one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. See you later on the panel discussions. So next is uh, Hokkaido, is uh, Miho. Hello, Miho. Oh, hello. OK, please start keynote. And after this, and I will turn the moderator over to Miho-san, and she will introduce us some startups relating to green tech. So please start. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. And I am going to share my screen and start my presentation. And yes, so I am from Startup City Sapporo. Okay, let me introduce what Sapporo City does. Okay, so to start with, I'm gonna use two words. One is Hokkaido, two is a Sapporo City. So let me just describe these two words. So Sapporo City uh, is located in the west side of Hokkaido and Hokkaido is an island located in the northern part of Japan. The entire island is called Hokkaido in Sapporo City. Uh, Sapporo is a city in Hokkaido famous for Sapporo beer. Sapporo is Japan's fifth largest metropolis. Over 60% of the land is covered by greenery. And the land is covered by six meters of snow for the period of 130 days a year. When the most beautiful snow is falling, we are organizing Tech Barbecue Sapporo, the first international startup conference in collaboration with a Danish organization, Tech Barbecue. We are looking for startups that want to pitch in front of investors on January 27th. So please Google Tech Barbecue Sapporo and apply from the page. For my information, just let me know. So going back to Sapporo, and this is called Sapporo Smile. And Sapporo City is trying to achieve the five goals, sustainability, management, innovation, livability, and economy. And within the past five years, Sapporo City is getting attention as an SDG future city. 
In March 2018, Sapporo set a goal to achieve the 17 sustainable development goals with the future image of a sustainable city where the next generation of children can live with a smile and was selected as an SDG future cities by the government of Japan. Since then, Sapporo City started to get attention from international organizations. Leadership in energy and environmental design, in short, LEAD, is a rating system devised by the United States Green Building Council to evaluate the environmental performance of a building and encourage market transformation towards sustainable design. In 2019, Sapporo applied for the LEAD for Cities and Communities program and was awarded Platinum certification, the highest rank. In 2020, in the areas of energy and water for its low greenhouse gas emissions and low per capita domestic wastewater use. In this category, it was the first Japanese city to be certified and achieve the highest score in the world. In 2020, Sapporo City announced to be a zero carbon city that would reduce the amount of greenhouse gases emitted by the city of Sapporo to virtually zero by 2050. Last year, Sapporo City Climate Change Action Plan was formulated with the lofty goal of cutting greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030, which is 55% reduction from 2016. This year, Sapporo was selected as one of the destinations by Global Destination Sustainability Movement, and it is the only city in Japan that this index is showcasing. The Global Destination Sustainability Movement, based in Barcelona, Spain, is a transformation platform that engages, inspires, and enables destinations to become more regenerative, flourishing, and resilient places to visit, meet, and live in. However, Japan as a whole is still lagging behind in terms of empowering clean tech startups. A research organization in the US analyzing clean tech industry is showcasing that the top 100 clean tech startups in the world, there was zero Japanese company on the top 100. According to McKinsey analysis, Japanese companies' overall performance lags behind that of companies in North America and Europe. We can do more to perform better in order to unlock greater value. So who's leading clean tech sector? Sapporo and Hokkaido do. And we are collaborating with international startups to integrate new technologies. Carbon Cure is a Canadian startup manufacturing a technology for the concrete industry that introduces recycled CO2 into fresh concrete to reduce its carbon footprint without compromising performances. CCUS, carbon dioxide capture utilization and stretch is a technology that is capturing and making effective use of the high concentrations of CO2 emitted by industrial activities. We can see the huge leap in the growth of funding opportunities for CCUS tech and one of the companies in Hokkaido is the very first one in Japan, producing low carbon concrete in a collaboration with a Canadian startup, Carbon Cure. MHI Vestas Offshore Wind is a joint venture launched by Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, and working on an offshore wind power project on the shore of Hokkaido. The government of Japan selected several cities in Hokkaido to be offshore wind promoting zones, expecting these areas to be advanced zone to utilize sea areas for the development of marine renewable energy power generation facilities. So who's next? It's your turn. As we've mentioned, Japan doesn't have enough good clean tech startups yet to showcase and Blue Ocean is right in front of you. Sapporo and Hokkaido are striving to be the center of ecotourism, green tourism, and zero emissions. And we want to be the clean tech hub in Japan. So teach us how we can empower clean tech startups and how global 
clean tech startups are tackling environmental challenges. So without further ado, let's move on to the pitch section. Okay, so the first pitch is going to be the pitch by Manuela. It's Manuela here. She's from Nedes Design. Hello, Manuela. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. So yeah, please Hi. feel free to yes, uh, screen share your screen and yes, share your pitch. You have five minutes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, my name is Manuela. I'm director of our startup, Nades Design. In 21st century, when technology is developed, the petroleum-based solvents are still present in the industry. They are responsible for more than 60% of all industrial emissions and more than 30% of all volatile organic compounds emissions. Those solvents end up in final food, cosmetic, or pharma products. Luckily, the aim of uh, Green Deal is to reduce use of those solvents by 2030. That was also our mission. For the last 10 years, we were developing 100% green biosolvents named natural deprotectic solvents. Those solvents are mixtures of at least two natural components and are liquid at room temperature. They are biodegradable, non-volatile, and non-toxic. The highest advantage of those solvents is the ease of their production once, you, uh, once the molar ratio is defined. Beside green character, those solvents are also designed solvents meaning that combining different molecules from the nature, it is possible to design at least 1 million different uh, solvents. The highest competitive advantage of our startup is the possibility to do design of those solvents in silico using mathematical models and software solution. Using those solvents, we developed three novel products, uh, plant cocktails from agri-food waste in NADA solvents, Currently, they are on technology readiness level 5. Our cocktails possess antioxidant, anti-aging, and antimicrobial activity. With those cocktails, we are entering food, pharma, and cosmetic market. It is estimated that those three markets will grow from 1.5 to 2 times by 2028, and our opportunity is 1%. In numbers, why not this base extracts are better than uh, currently available extracts in the market. So now the solvents are, uh, are possible to dissolve at least one times higher concentration of active molecules from the plant. So in the end, you get a 40% cheaper product. Also, shelf life of our extracts are prolonged for three months at room temperature. Our production is zero waste, while uh, currently, currently available production on the market causes at least 40 kilograms of waste per milligram of product. Our extracts are raw materials for the final uh, cosmetic food or pharma product, so we also perform, perform proof of the concept studies for fortification of chocolate milk or as a raw material for cosmetic products. Industry will need to adopt uh, green solutions by a law, and we offer them a collaboration through B2B business model. For a year, our team of uh, seven scientists is trying to fulfill the gap between academia and industry, and we believe that now is the time when industry is ready, is ready to adopt green solutions and if we join forces uh, we can create one uh, sustainable green industry um, thank you for your kind in, uh, for your attention and if you have any further questions uh, here are our details thank you so much manila so yeah what you're doing is already amazing and what i also like is uh you are working in a team of female scientists uh with experience over 10 years it's 
amazing. It's rare to see like all the female scientists working on a startup in Japan. So you're the future, <laughs> I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So let's move on to the next pitch. Thank you so much, Manuelo. And the next pitch is by Mario from C Cross. Hello, Mario. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, greetings. Oh, yes. Yeah, Mario. Hello. So, yeah, please uh, start your, your screen. And Thank you for the introduction. Let's start. Okay. So, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, first of all, thank you for inviting me to present here today. It is a great privilege. My name is Mario Spadena and I am the current CEO of Sikras. Sikras is a Croatian startup that does coastal waters monitoring by high resolution satellites. Now, I will start with a little bit of depressive subject and then we'll go to a positive subject, of course. Pollution is mostly man-made in coastal area, it happens readily. Just two weeks ago, we had an oil spill in Croatia. So basically, what we need in this global problem is means to react. Okay, but quality of coastal water degrades not only due to man-made our fault, but also due to the climate change effects. Okay, and the basis for any prevention and mitigation is sufficient water quality data, and this is what we give by high-resolution satellite data. What I want to always propose a little bit and to explain is, of course, how the procedure, at least in European Union, goes. Okay, in order to, for us to become resilient to the problems, we need strong action plans. And every strong action plan starts with a high quality data, of course. And this is very, again, come into play. And how we do it in a sketch approximation, we use different satellite data sources. We combine them with on-site data, for example, sensors, buoys, and so forth. And in a single hand analysis, we, we obtain better water quality estimates, such as this wastewater discharges, monitoring, biochemistry aspect, and for example, oil spills as a major pollution. A unique value proposition that we offer our clients, we have already entered the market, is more than six times cheaper monitoring service compared to classical on site sampling or hardware installation. And the carbon or greenhouse emissions are more than tenfold decrease. Of course, because satellites are in the orbit, once they are there, they don't pollute. Okay, so that's a really a big advantage. Now, but I, there is a thing to address here at, at, at this point. When pollution occurs, we can see it, we can quantify it, but it's a short-term benefit, okay? But what really gives the resilience is a long-term. So when we work with our clients, we give them analysis through the six months, month or yearly period. And in that time, we are able to see the trends that are happening in their coastal areas. And this is what makes them resilient later because they can tune their action plans to mitigate, prevent or recover from the pollution occurrences. Here is one of the client testimonials. Our, one of our clients is National Park Brioni. Of course, they need to have high quality of waters because for them it is the restricted area. And in fact, tourists come to see the beautiful islands. So for them, we managed to isolate different parts of their national park. And in fact, we saw that from nearby coastal urbanization of Pula and Italy from the western side, they get the pollution. They themselves did not pollute, but of course they get the pollution from nearby urbanization. Now they can react in 2023 and 2024. Mm -hmm. So basically from the almost same data stream or data analysis, we have three different product, oil scope for enhanced oil monitoring, pollution scope, and biochemistry monitoring. I will just briefly go over the all just to see any possibilities of collaboration in, in later areas. Oil scope basically uses innovative approach of both optical and radar data. And just now we've got a Eurostars grant for that, and which was rated 94% efficiency, so top notch product right there. For the pollution scope, that's typically designed for coastal urbanization, maritime spatial planning, and ESG monitoring, uh, where we we'll pinpoint sewage water discharges and then we monitor them in near real time. As you can see here on the video, we are in TRL5 also there. Our revenue model is quite simple. Okay, it goes simple schematics of monitoring and sustainability reporting schemes, starting from base pricing of 1,000 euro per month. For more advanced user and for advanced visualization, we also co-develop co and offer BI tool, which is a bit more expensive, but so far people don't want to use it, okay? People just want to see 
or here is the water quality good or not so uh, typically our current revenue model with reoccurring revenues follows the former scheme now of course market the biggest investment ask uh, we special in fact we want to go in maritime space uh, transport and energy sector niche environmental monitoring and coastal tourism and typically only in european union uh, obtainable market is around 650 million euros so there is plenty for all but we are fighting and we are fighting against big competitors uh, the world leader eo map i put them here because they are what we want to achieve or more so we try to tackle them and orbital for os for oil spills monitoring and our competitive advantage there is that we really focus on classification in coastal waters and and in big part of the for example even europe coastal waters are near are almost transparent so that makes a big problem for satellites and we specialize in classifications which give us advantage in long term and against of course companies that do robotics or unmanned vessels we have advantage of being cheaper and easily scalable i will ask a little bit for the money of course because it is the pitch maybe some investor looks at these slides so typically we are now in uh, we have two products and tier four and five we have first clients we want grants we have grants approved for the 2023 and 2024 in more than 250k euros on equity we are in fundraising campaign basically to finalize oil scope to launch it to the market in the second quarter of 2023 and to launch pollution scope in the beginning of 2024 because it follows the new directive by european union which is non-financial sustainability reporting and our product is designed exactly to assess this market uh, but of course the strongest part is the team okay we are a core team of three scientists which we complemented by a business and financial management experts and this is of course just a core team and we have already pool of people to employ now in 2023 uh, i will not go into self track record or high praises of ourselves but please if you have any questions contact us we are always open for collaboration and partnerships thank you Thank you so much, Mario. So yeah, uh, it's amazing and you're using satellite data and um, actually Hokkaido is planning to launch a global commercial space port in Asia in Hokkaido in 2025. So hope we can collaborate in the near future. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, so yeah, let's move on to the next pitch. It's gonna be Tarbo from SolarStone. Hi Tarbo, are you ready? Yes. Thank you so much for joining. And maybe you're muted, I guess. I think it's better now. Yes, amazing. Yeah, perfect. OK, so yeah, let's start uh, your pitch by sharing your screen. OK, and meanwhile, while you're preparing for it, I can um, Quickly introduce about yourself. So SolarStone is developing solar rooftop solutions and the materials and has created a pioneering design product which enables transforming standard PV panels into a two-in-one solution. So I think you can explain better. So yeah, please feel free to take your microphone. I added to the name a bit of this uh... Uh, Japanese spice, what you reflected also that uh, Japan is not even close to reaching the ESG targets. But uh, as you reflected, uh, SolarStone is developing uh, uh, solar solutions, but uh, going step uh, step back, maybe like what's going on in the market is that uh, everybody is doing uh, software, but uh, in, in our uh, let's say vision software cannot solve the the uh, issues the world has we need hardware to to save the planet we need hardware to reach all the climate targets and we need software only to optimize once the function hardware is already in use and uh, we're getting to the hardware soon but uh, solar stone um, in its, in its nature is leading uh, 
solar solution developer in the Nordics, we've been in the business for, for the past seven years, have so far built uh, nearly 800 uh, solar roofs. We have uh, one unique uh, patent technology and uh, this year we launched a different kind of um, business model which has uh, a huge uh, socio-economical uh, aspect. So what we do is we, we design, we develop and we produce uh, solar hardware and software. The, the solar solutions which we produce act as building skin, which means that the regular roofing material or facade material is not necessary. So we also actually are not producing green products, but also uh, are resource efficient in, in that sense. Uh, the solar solutions which we develop, develop can be used as solar infrastructure and this way we actually turn solar as a primitive from primitive uh, product into uh, different solutions and, and services while the uh, world today understands solar in that sense that uh, it can be integrated it, it can be installed on the land which in japan's case is not possible because you don't have uh, available land uh, or in the sense of installing solar on the rooftop, then uh, our approach is different. We have two main products in our portfolio. Uh, the first one is uh, a smaller solar module, which can be integrated with uh, roof tiles, concrete roof tiles, for example, and leaves uh, an aesthetical look of the roof. And then we have uh, a second solution, which is similar, except we use uh, large modules uh, again to build uh, solar roofs that are uh, solar roofs that already act as a roofing material and in this case how we do it is that uh, uh, we take a random solar module from the market and what we have done is we have developed a certain framing kit which we implement around the existing solar module and we turn the regular solar module which generally is being installed on the farmland or on the rooftop we turn it into building integrated roofing material so there is uh, there is no need again for regular roofing material underneath but the solar thanks to this framing set already acts as a roofing material but not to speak too long about uh, solar only, uh, like I'm speaking how we actually can use solar in a different sense than we have done it uh, so far, especially in Japan's case where you have to be creative actually to implement uh, solar. And uh, we can name it in different uh, ways. We can call it economy 2.0. We can call it uh, solar as a financial instrument. But the idea is that uh, we turn solar into, into services. It can be infrastructure as a service, energy as a service, roof as, as a service. First, what can be done? So uh, let's take like right now in uh, like the Central and Eastern European approach because I'm not so familiar with, uh, uh, let's say Japan in that sense, but uh, there are like uh, millions of buildings that have been built uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago and never been renovated. And uh, the renovation will not happen eventually in the future because uh, it's getting more expensive. Uh, the interest rates are super high. People don't want to borrow the money, etc. But if the roof hasn't been renovated for 40 years. It means that the product life cycle is over and eventually the roof starts leaking. Now, if the, if the people in the house don't like fix it, then the house, uh, like the roof will start leaking. And what can be done with solar? With uh, solar, it's possible to renovate the roof for free for the homeowners. The idea is that uh, investors will invest into the roof and the owners of the apartments will just purchase the energy 
generated on the roof from the investors. So instead of purchasing from the grid, they purchase from the investor and uh, they don't need to borrow money. They just pay the bill that they generally bill pay to the electricity company. They pay to the, to the investor company who invested into the roof. Simple as that, just like the service model design. Uh, the second uh, uh, electrical vehicle charging. Again, in Europe, uh, there are more cars than there is available electrical infrastructure for electric vehicle charging, and it, it, it's going on only worse. So what can be done is actually use the existing parking lots to produce solar energy. This is exactly or similar picture as uh, solar farms on the land, except in the cities, you don't have farmland, but you have a lot, lot of parking lots and also parking houses. So while turning this primitive one functional parking space into multi-dimensional services, thanks to these kind of uh, solar carports, a lot of renewable energy could be produced on site to the existing buildings, but also for electrical vehicles infrastructure. Uh, third, what we've done is that uh, we've taken a solar, a regular uh, standard frame, steel framed hall, which for 20 years has seen no innovation. And instead of the regular PVC or sandwich or metal building skin, we install our own solar module building skin. And this way we turn actually the building into a large amount of energy generating building. And, and what it means, while it looks like a primitive building, actually underneath you can build anything. You can build indoor soccer halls, tennis courts, greenhouses, horse riding halls, uh, like industry parks, etc. But the but the effect here is that because the buildings generate a lot of energy, then investors can build can invest into those buildings and earn money back from the generated energy. But the buildings can be given for free to the users. And it means like so municipalities, sports clubs, NGOs, companies can get these buildings for free. It never has happened in the history that we actually can build infrastructure for free. This is the first time because energy pays it off. So I've spoken with multiple, let's say, Japanese NGOs, companies, etc., that have have reflected me that uh, there is like high uh, need to reach uh, this uh, ESG targets, but there is no solutions. And this is exactly one thing how on new infrastructure you can reach like the targets a uh, similar way like in building new infrastructure new housing just use solar as roofing material or other infrastructure element and all this firstly can be built much cheaper because actually they generate more turnover but also like these are energy in uh, renewable energy intensive uh, infrastructure. So when we're speaking or the world is speaking about different renewable technologies, then wind, hydrogen, fusion, nuclear, all are like seven, 10, 15 years ago, away from, uh, from actually being mature or like scalable, but solar is the only scalable and uh, current cheap solution how we actually can can uh, save the planet if somebody's saying that uh, developing infrastructure is uh, exp expensive then we say that thanks to solar infrastructure development can be actually free thank you okay thank you that was a very cool solar panel and like solar solution thank you very much and okay so let's move on to the next um pitch uh sajat from float mill so sajat are you here yeah hello 
Hi, amazing. So he's from Hokkaido University. So looking forward to your pitch. I'm going to share the screen. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Uh, all right. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Sajjad. I'm from Float Meal. So we are trying to develop a next generation protein source, Wolfia cultivation system. Uh, these are my teammates. I'll talk about them later. So uh, one third of our total carbon emission comes from agriculture. And uh, as we all know, two third of that actually comes from the food production regarding uh, related to protein. So uh, we actually de uh, delved a little bit deeper into the problem. And so we can see that 39% of the carbon emission actually comes from the production uh, that is uh, regarding to agriculture, such as protein. So on the right side, we can see uh, the 39% of these uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission actually comes from several different parameters, such as inefficient manure management, fertilizer runoff, and methane from cows. And most of them have one thing in common, that these are waste. And uh, there is no way to return these resources back into our food system. So we delved into uh, a solution that can return these things in our food system. And we looked at the duckweed, Wolfia. Uh, in Thailand, it is called eggs of the water, and it contains 40% of the dry weight as protein. And uh, it also has other uh, vitamin B12, which is very uh, rare in the plant uh, protein plant. So we can see over here that, uh, you know, in Thailand, uh, they have been eating this Wolfia for centuries. And this is how they uh, collect the duckweed from the water. And uh, this is how they sell it. It's sold as a poor man's food and without any kind of uh, real value added to it. Now, we looked at this. This is a solution that can be totally used to recirculate our agriculture. But uh, the production facility or technology, in terms of that, there is a huge gap. So we first made this uh, hydroponic, vertical hydroponic system for growing duckweed. So this is our prototype, which is float farm. And uh, over there, we can uh, actually do a POC with the agriculture runoff water and also just uh, clean hydroponics water. And we could produce uh, fresh protein and also fertilizer or feed quality, uh, animal feed quality uh, duckweed. And on, on the other side, we could also produce uh, food quality uh, protein, which is uh, on the right side, using fresh water. So we saw that this float farm has the capability uh, the, of growing wolfia. So we looked into a little bit uh, deeper into how to make it better. Uh, so I've been doing my research on uh, duckweed production and growth promotion technology for five years. So together with uh, the team, we created uh, this float farm that can actually produce uh, protein enough to feed 20 people in one day. And uh, this is like a float farm three that we are currently raising money to build a POC of. Uh, now, the market is very huge. The duckweed protein market at this moment is uh, currently our Sam and Som, which is uh, going to be around $165.6 million uh, by the next year. And we know that this can be uh, this can actually have an impact in the global protein market, which is seventy three billion dollars uh, in the upcoming years. Um, now, what is the business model? So we currently thinking we're currently thinking of uh, using fa uh, farming as a service business model where we we have the technology. We, we put this float farm tree close to the farm or the factories where we um, produce value-added wolfia or the wolfia protein that eventually goes uh, gets into a food which is basically a lot of food that can be made but we are currently working with uh, companies to make plant-based meat and plant-based tofu and uh, which is basically kind of like a, a protein food and then uh, yeah the consumers uh, we're looking at are more cost effective their value proposition is going to be uh, more cost-effective nutrition and increased food choices and reduced environmental impact. We actually made uh, a comparison uh, of how much uh, actually uh, environmental impact is um, generated from beef 
versus Wolfia. And we have seen that tremendous reduction of the greenhouse gas can be possible. And uh, yeah, we have been uh, right now, we have been prototyping with the food industry and raising money to incorporate the company. So this, this is my team, which is, uh, I'm basically the scientist. And uh, we have Moana, we, who is uh, the CEO. And uh, we have from, uh, from Africa, South, uh, West Africa, we have Helmano. And uh, uh, Radwan is from Macedonia. So we have a global outlook to solve a problem that is in Japan and uh, kind of scale up uh, towards uh, other markets. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sajja. So it's so exciting to see your progress and I'm looking forward to see what's gonna do next. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. So let's move on to the next pitch. Uh, it's gonna be Nikita from Trustify Tech. So Nikita, are you ready here? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I'm I can hear you. Thank you very much, yes. So please feel free to share your screen and start your pitch. And yes, so you're the um, hi so everybody. Okay. Yeah. Hi everybody. I'm Nick. Okay, I don't know if someone's talking. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Nikita from Trashfire, and I'm here to talk about smarter waste management. The global waste management industry is suffering. Let's look at India and the EU alone, which collectively produce more than 3 billion tons of waste every year. They want to become more sustainable, but the problem lies in doing so without verifiable targets. These regions rely heavily on the manual collation of data in their waste management facilities that diminishes their ability to analyze trends in their waste streams. This in turn causes them to incorrectly segregate their waste. In response to such issues, there is a global change towards a circular economy. And in keeping with that trend, we at Trashify aim to incorporate digitization into the waste management processes. We're doing this using a hardware-enabled SaaS approach, introducing Trashify Horus. With the Trashify Horus, material recovery facilities are able to detect and analyze their waste streams in real time using our proprietary AI-powered computer vision. The Trashify module a hardware AI detection unit can be retrofitted onto existing sorting lines without causing any changes to the existing infrastructure or operations. Its main purpose is to detect 100% of the incoming waste stream on the conveyor belt, the data for which is then stored in our cloud backend and can be subsequently visualized on the trash of our analytics, a completely customizable dashboard. Using this dashboard, our clients are able to derive insights about the material composition, the value and volume of the waste in their facilities. Our business model is a monthly subscription to the aforementioned hardware along with this software, which is a web-based app for analytics. Over the past one year since Trashify was first conceived, we've obtained funding from two premier accelerator programs across Europe. The first from Beamline Accelerator, about whom we just heard so much about, which is the leading clean tech accelerator program across Central Emerging Europe, and the second from Startup Wise Guys, who are leaders across various sectors of startups, us being incorporated into the sustainability batch. We've also landed our first industrial client, Keskenade Nuset, which is one of the largest waste management facilities in Estonia. In fact, we launched our pilot program in one of their facilities just last month. Our product journey begins right now with industrial detection, and by the second quarter of 2023, we also aim to incorporate robotics into our processes. By the third quarter of 2023, we also aim to penetrate the Indian market and land at least 10 to 15 material recovery facilities as our clients. We aim to become completely profitable by the third year, that's 2024. The global smart waste management industry is currently valued at 2.5 billion euros with an annual growth rate of 20%. We aim to focus on the almost 30,000 material recovery facilities across the globe based on the relevance of our product and starting with Eastern Europe, Scandinavia and India. We aim to have a significant advantage over our competitors, mainly in terms of the wide range of features that we provide, along with the ability for robotics integration. We also continuously train our models that enables us to provide the unique volume to weight estimation feature that currently only Trashify is able to provide. 
So to bring all of these facts together, I think now we can safely conclude that the Trashify Horus enables material recovery facilities to have a centralized database in the form of real-time reporting that further enables them to knowledgeably segregate their waste. Our goal is to enable them to increase their recycling rates and reach their annual targets more effectively. Trashify was first conceived at the Ultra Hack Hackathon in October 2021, where three friends who'd known each other for more than 12 years put their mutual interest in sustainability to good use to win the hackathon. Since then, we've co-founded this company and completed a fully functioning technology demonstrator together. We're currently raising a pre-seed round of 500,000 euros that we aim to put to good use to expand our team, to expand our market to other regions and to develop our technology further. We at Trashify truly believe that recycling should be a solution, not a problem. After all, it's trash can, not trash can't. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you very much for that. I like really your like motto. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Okay, so let's move on to the next uh, pitch. Uh, Dushan, are you here? Okay, thank you so much for joining today. Okay, hi. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Um, okay, perfect. Then and that you can see the slide. Yes, uh, we can play that slide. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> my name is Dushan and we are Magic Forest. Uh, we are the new generation uh, carbon offsetting uh, platform and we are building a carbon trade uh, platform that transfers forest carbon value into digital currency. Okay, just uh, my slides don't work for some reason. Uh, Okay, sorry. <clears throat> well, uh, what I wanted to say that uh, companies actually uh, have to offset their carbon footprint and uh, they are required by the regulators, customers, their staff and uh, public opinion in general. So on the other hand, forest owners uh, make money only by cutting the trees and uh, there is no sustainable financial model in it uh, for them. So our solution is uh, to connect them and uh, we are turning uh, forest into new asset class by digitizing its carbon value uh, into digital tokens. And this opens them up as the investment opportunity for companies or third parties. Uh, the slide change is very, very slow. So the carbon offset market size is more than $1 billion. Uh, currently, and it is estimated to reach 190 billion by 2000, uh, uh, 2030. Uh, and EU is the largest single market. Uh, so our value proposition is that we do carbon offsets with added value, and we turn forests from liabilities into assets. We provide forest owners uh, extra earnings and incentives financial incentives to conserve their natural capital, the natural ecosystems that fight climate change in long term. Uh, so how it works. Uh, I'm sorry, we have some technical problems that the, the slides move very slowly. Uh, so forest owners uh, register on uh, our platform and they get the carbon calculation. They get their initial offering and unique land ID. We generate uh, carbon tokens uh, via blockchain and uh, make a unique asset ID for them. And then it is uh, transferred uh, to our marketplace and the polluting companies connect via our platform or through API for the, their accounting. So we are trying to create a system that is uh, building carbon uh, accounting uh, similar to currently financial accounting. Uh, but our forest land can also be bought uh, and in long term it can be uh, created as an asset and opened to investors. So we created also a possibility that uh, people who are not interested in uh, uh, 
uh, offsetting uh, directly. So they are not polluting company, but they are just interested investors. We can open it as a as a independently an asset class. And this is why we created this forest investment fund idea. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, it is really just moving so slow. I don't know if even I don't know why. Uh, well, I'll just so the forest investment fund uh, basically collects money from interested uh, investors, and uh, we select as uh, our, our expertise the best value for money uh, ecological systems like forests or uh, meadows or, or swamps, and uh, we put them into the marketplace. And actually, it works in a way that we can uh, return money for the conservation of the ecosystems uh, and uh, so we offer it in a size of uh, 10 to 250 000, uh, euro we offer our expertise and the carbon calculations and the investors get their returns uh, in the values as as you can see around 10 percent per year uh, for the competitors, there are competitors in the carbon offsetting market, but our main differences are that we are creating new assets and we are using blockchain to secure transparency and safe transactions. And I have one case study that I would like to showcase, but uh, unfortunately still the, the problem. Uh, so we combine for the case study, we combine the forest owners, uh, several forest owners to uh, connect uh, to a polluting company. And uh, after the transaction, our, comp our uh, partner company uh, burns the tokens that were created uh, through the uh, offset. And uh, uh, we, we, co we are left with a total revenue of 1,100 euro. And it's a kind of annual carbon accounting, so we expect high customer lifetime value. We are already in revenue and have earned around uh, 50,000 euro in the last 12 months. And our monthly revenue is growing uh, each year. So we are now looking for uh, 450,000 euro in the seed round, uh, uh, which we are closing in uh, February. And... Uh, we want to uh, use it to develop the platform further and to get more customers uh, onto the marketplace. Uh, we are an experienced and well-balanced team with backgrounds in the forest biology sciences, uh, startup success and technology development who have worked together for around 15 years now. Uh, we are the magic forest and we are the next generation of carbon offsetting. So this would be it, but uh, I'm afraid that uh, I see that the presentation didn't run uh, all the way to the end, probably. I think we find it. Yeah, we somehow saw it. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much for the presentation, Dushan. And like, yeah, it's so exciting that you're integrating this token economy and also a carbon footprint. Thank you very much. OK, so let's, let's move on to the uh, next pitch. Um, Marco, are you here? Yeah, hi. Um, okay. Let so, me share my screen. Uh, so, Marco, okay, yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah, go ahead. Do you see my presentation? Give us a second. Yes, it's here. Yeah. So, hi everyone. I'm Marco. Let me tell you about Nuo2, uh, Croatia's first alumni of Beamline Accelerator. So, this is the part where I'm supposed to shock you with what you already know very well. Too much CO2 in the air causes huge climate changes. Let's keep it all and go straight to our solution. Nuo2. A smart active panel that draws in surrounding air. CO2 from this air is broken down into carbon and oxygen. The carbon is bound to our catalyst and the oxygen is released with the rest of the stream. This way, NUO2 panels keep CO2 levels low and oxygen levels high. So your heating and ventilation system works less, which saves energy, lowers your carbon footprint and saves you money. Along with CO2, we're catching the other bad guys. Viruses, bacteria, pollen and dust. Basically, it's like you're having a tree with a power cord inside your office. 
The first grants made our life a bit easier, so we built a proof of concept and verified the idea. Later on, we made four alpha prototypes, and here you can see them in front of our office in Zagreb. Besides that, we filed for one patent application and more to come. And we were awarded two gold medals for innovation on Croatian and international level. NUA2 mitigates the negative impact of buildings' power consumption. To produce one more two panel, we emit 10 kilos of CO2. But after only four months, each one of them is carbon negative. One panel removes 37 kilos of CO2, and further research will help us scale this number to even greater impact. Our customers will rent our product, they cut down their carbon footprint and their heating costs while improving the air quality. This way, we have two revenue streams. First one is panel rent, and carbon trading is coming up real soon as a second one. With, with the grant so far, and despite two earthquakes and a worldwide microchip shortage, we developed four alpha prototypes and reached TRL4. By now, we have one patent application with more to come. The next step is to develop a beta prototype and then produce a small batch to be installed and tested through pilot projects with our early adopters who already gave us letters of intent. For this, we're fundraising 500k as a mix of investments and grants, which will be distributed in these five verticals. Engineering, management, production, services, and logistics. So, this is us. I'm the founder of NUA2, Ivan Eisel, CGO. We hold agreements of collaboration with creation institutes and faculties and their experts. So, I bet you 100k that you won't find a better indoor solution for energy saving and CO2 capture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. So this was the last presentation, and we want to briefly uh, move on to the next session, which is a Q&A session, kind of panel uh, among all the ecosystem builders. And I would like uh, Elki and Philip to come back, if that's OK with all of you. Yes. There are just too many things to learn from your developed ecosystem, I think. And hello, Elke. So um, I would like to ask a question uh, about like how um, you like transform like Estonia ecosystem to focus on uh, clean tech. So because like uh, in Japan, majority of investors were uh, still like focusing on scalability and also financial return. And I feel like um, most of the startups getting investment are still like picky. And I feel like Estonia also has a lot of uh, tech uh, companies, tech startups. So um, in terms of like the mindset of these investors and startups, like how did you or did the ecosystem in Estonia change the mindset to walk toward clean tech while making impact on SDGs? Yeah, uh, that is that is a very kind of frequent question that pops up every now and then. And of course, clean tech investments tend to be more hardware related, and if it's hardware related, it might also be science related. So this all most of the times kind of scares away the investors. Um, although we are seeing kind of like a new generations of of the VCs or investors coming, um, so meaning that the investors are of course they're after profit. But the new terms and kind of conditions, regulations that are coming also to the financial institutions, especially in the EU, they guide the investments to be more impact related. So taking into account the ESG, for example, the environmental, social and governance aspects, um, the financial institutions have to comply with the sustainable finance directives, etc. So all of the investments that are to be done, um, they have to be measured. Um, the data has to be there, of course, to do that, as well as kind of the outlining of the measurements on based on what or compared to what everybody is measuring these. Um, that has to be settled still. There are small improvements, though, um, and we can see that definitely the impact plus profit mentality, if you might call it like that, is, is an emerging one. Um, it's not easy, of course. Of course, it's not easy because the return on investment for those kind of hardware startups is a bit longer. Um, but but uh, there's a ch change in the mindset. And of course, as I mentioned before as well, the twin tech startups have evident customers already down in the pipeline waiting for those uh, technologies. 
Thank you very much. My next question will be so um like for hardware startup, they need a lot of like initial investment. So I was actually surprised with the survival rate, eighty percent. So I think you briefly mentioned, but is there any tips to like make them survive longer? Or? Um, again, if you already have a cleantech startup developing something hardware related, it's rather it's uh, let's say it's it's more difficult to put it in a shelf compared to, for example, software as a service, where software as a service companies, I mean, they, of course, they develop faster. They can uh, test their product. They can validate their product. They get the product market fit, et cetera, faster. If they don't, it's easier to wrap things up. Uh, so, for example, if you take some hardware-related st startup, um, there's an a engineering team behind it that further develops and improves the product, et cetera, et cetera. So, but it all has to be led by a visionary founder, that's for mm -hmm. sure. So I guess the founders are those that are kind of like the needles in the haystack that everybody's looking for. If you find this needle in a haystack uh, of a clean tech founder, it, it's rather difficult to, to turn things upward or, or down and, and kind of uh, stop the production and development of the startup. As well as um, the hardware related startups, they often have also you know different grants, uh, scholars for for developing their product. This is a, this is a very strong trend that is also influencing the uptake and, and survival rate of the hardware startups. That's amazing. I was once working in a hardware startup, so I know it's how hard it is. So <laughs> that's amazing. So uh, Philip. I think I want to ask you about like the like how you are supporting university students through your program because uh, we are currently trying to collaborate with Hokkaido University and what you're doing for students are amazing. So uh, how do we change the mindset of students to become impact driven entrepreneurs? <laughs> yes, that's uh, that's a good question. I mean. Uh, you, you know, you have to know that you first need to go have a good selection because not everyone is supposed to have any entrepreneurial aspirations. So first of all, you, you pick the students that have those and uh, then you work with them, uh, most likely applying some of the some of the tools that they usually use to have fun. So uh, recently we, we use uh, some tools to increase gamification, so to, to give them some points and then um, have them, um, let's, let's say, attracted by, by the competition or during the whole time. Uh, another one is to use social media, especially in some new, uh, let's say, the, the newest uh, social media like TikTok, which they use daily, and then uh, have them uh, being promoted on the social media themselves and shared by by us so that they get a better reach. So that's something that we saw is uh, interesting to them and uh, if we appealing. Uh, I mean, the, the, the biggest uh, impact is the learning curve. So they, they are supposed to learn about the entrepreneurial uh, skills and the mindset. And then we can hope that they can apply some of that in their future uh, careers and possibly one day become real entrepreneurs. That's cool, yes. Yeah, learning curve is like they have a steep curve, I guess. So it's amazing. So um, I also have a question to both of you, maybe starting with Philip. So you have extensive network with a lot of international organizations, for example, EIT. And for LK, maybe that, like you are basically raising all the organization working on clean tech uh, in Estonia. So yeah, Philip, to start with like, what's how was the tip to build an extensive network with the other uh, clean tech ecosystem and how are you bridging clean tech ecosystems uh what's the tip uh, you have to just uh, mingle around a lot of people and try to meet them as, as much as you can that's one and the second one would be to uh, be proactive and uh, try to try to figure out a project, uh, a, a program, something that makes sense, something that can help both sides and then uh, create the benefit for the other, other side to collaborate. And I think that could be something appealing to everybody. And 
you know, maybe start small and then, you know, towards a bigger vision. Uh, yeah, that's what, what I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So, Elgi, how about you? Yeah, I would, uh, I totally agree with that. I mean, networking is indeed networking uh, in, in our walks in life, I, I assume kind of developing the ecosystem from the very ground up is time consuming. There's a lot of blood, sweat and tears. But I think for, for from our perspective, the main focus has been working with founders. So working with the visionary founders, um, helping them get off the ground and with it's kind of like a, a side um, benefit of uh, being in the network of that as well. If you try to take care of the founders, you happen to well, end up in the correct places, either it's networking events or different startup events or traveling worldwide. Um, that doesn't matter, but kind of just meeting the right people at the right time. Um, it doesn't need too much luck, but, but rather, um, as Philip said, it needs, um, um, concise decisions on doing, you know, doing it consecutively at all times, being persistent. I, I guess that's what I'm looking for. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, we have so many things to learn from you, I think, uh, because we are just um, trying to accelerate our ecosystem. So yeah, I yes, today we will need to finish because we are over time, but we will like to um, continuously discussing with you and continuously collaborating with you. So thank you very much. And I think we can wrap up this time. And thank you for all the startup founders pitching tonight for this morning <laughs> and looking forward to see your further progress in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Good luck with developing the Sapporo ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And if you want to uh, introduce any startup to Tech Barbecue Sapporo, yeah, please. <laughs> yes. Will do. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>